Welcome to the How Soccer Explains Leadership Podcast, where we explore leadership principles through the lens of the beautiful game. Here are your hosts, Phil Dark and Ryan North. Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. Today, I'm very excited to bring this interview to you. I have a good friend who also just happens to be my daughter's coach at university. He is Graham Roxborough, and he's with Trinity Western. He's the women's head soccer coach there. He also is the founder and executive director of Team Up, which we're going to get to hear about today. But before we get to Graham, I just want to remind you to subscribe to this podcast. If you haven't done so already, just go and subscribe wherever you're listening to this. You can hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss any of the future episodes. Also, if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast. It gets it out there to more and more people. And if you want to get more involved in this conversation, you can go and join the Facebook group. Even if you're not on Facebook, just join Facebook so you can join this group because we'd love to hear more from you and have deeper conversations with you about these important topics. So without more from me on that, Graham, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing very well this morning, Phil. Thanks for uh, having me on as a guest. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is something we've been wanting for a while. I am excited to get through some of these conversations that we've had in your kitchen, some of these conversations we've been able to have on the phone. And so now I'm glad that we're able to share them with, with the other folks out there. So before we get into kind of the meat of it, although I, th- I always think this is the meat as well, I love hearing stories. And so can you just share your story, particularly how you got to be head coach of Trinity Western, the executive director of Team Up, and of course, husband, father, lay pastor, club coach, all these other titles that you hold as well. But let's focus on really the head coach and director of team up. Uh, long story, but I'll make it really short. Grew up overseas, grew up in, in England, just outside of London. So obviously soccer, football is what we called it. It was passion of mine. Also grew up in a family that was pretty dynamic in faith. And dad was a pastor of a fairly large church in England. And it connected me to some personalities that were both in sport and the Christian world and faith. And I got to be around sporting events like Wimbledon up close because of some of the people that came to our church. So I always had these seeds planted of, wow, you can actually integrate faith, which is important, but also sport and high level sports and got to hear numerous athletes share a little bit about how faith and spirituality impacted their lives. So that planted seeds. It got me to Wheaton College, which was a really special time in my life and really special institution, great place, great culture. I played on the men's soccer team there. And during that time, I got exposed to the idea of doing soccer, sports service, missions trips. And I really was touched deeply by that and had a choice at the end of my university career. Could I go back to England and probably try to make a a go of it in in non-league soccer or like semi-pro soccer? Or do I get involved in doing something that had touched my heart, which was sport ministry? Never really thought I'd do something sport ministry oriented for a long period of time, but I I dove in and started taking teams overseas and working with a number of different sports groups, working with college athletes that wanted to make a difference using their sport. So that brought me to Vancouver, British Columbia. My family had relocated uh, from Chicago out uh, onto the West Coast, pretty beautiful spot to relocate. And then I got involved with both Athletes in Action at the time and then helping my brother with a local church plant and a local small Christian university down the road, one of the only ones in Canada, actually. They're they're a dime a dozen in some ways in the U.S., but very unique natured university here in, in just outside of Vancouver called Trinity Western. So I came on as the men's assistant for a year or two, and then just Athletes in Action was taking me all over the world. So it was hard to be an assistant. And when they started their women's program, it was a couple of years in, they identified me as somebody that might want to coach. And I said, yes, for a year that try it out and see how that would go. And here I am 21 years later, having been their head coach for, for that length of time. So it's just been a real privilege to kind of integrate faith and sport and high level soccer, helping young athletes, aspiring student athletes not just achieve success on the field, but also inspire them to, you know, what type of a difference can their lives make, whether they go on and become teachers or doctors or lawyers or whatever they're doing, coaches. So yeah, it's been a real joy and combining the two loves of my life. Well, I got a few other loves of my life, but sport and faith and seeing how 
some long-term impact can take shape has been both in the university setting and coaching, but also in some of my international work. It's been really rewarding and, and a lot of fun. I can't wait to see what comes next. I can't either because I've, I've been very excited to see what's already been happening and we'll get into that in a minute. The one thing you didn't mention that I do want to say, just because I want to show people out there that I, I am a, bit, a bridge builder, that Graham is a lifelong Liverpool supporter as well. And so that hasn't stopped me from inviting him to be on the show or to call him friend, quite frankly. So we've actually watched Liverpool matches at his home together and, and there was no blows thrown or anything. So... That was pretty amicable, actually. And it just shows your intelligence, Phil, by obviously not just surrounding yourself with one-mindedness. It's easy for me to say now that we're on the top of the perch, but it, it's cyclical. Your team will be back one day and my team will be struggling again, but it's kind of fun while it lasts. Yeah, yeah. Now I know you've been having a lot of fun with it, and I, I have not been having as much fun with it. That's okay. That's okay. Because we can still have good conversations like this one today. So... Now, I do want to move in to talk a little bit more about Team Up. And really, if you look at the website, it talks about how you use the powerful tool of sports as the common language for building bridges and cultivating relationships with the purpose of impacting lives of those we connect with. What does that look like in reality? Can you just share about what Team Up is doing around the world? Yeah, maybe I can just give it a bit of context. First, Phil, like having done sports ministry and i think there's so many different modes of what that means but using sport as a bridge builder and you know i've been all over the world i've now been in 80 countries either helping establish some sport ministries or coming alongside sport ministries that needed whether that's an injection of some energy or resources or leadership development i just began as i as i traveled around the world and seeing some of the great needs and then also having a deep, deep conviction and love that uh, vibrant local churches are really needing to be at the forefront of making a difference in the neighborhood, making a difference in the community. And that's maybe something that I didn't always sense when I was working in some of the areas of sports ministry. So as I traveled to some of the different parts of the world that I saw real need and real opportunity to help local organizations and predominantly local churches love their neighborhood tangibly and practically and, and with, with physical needs being met and resources that could, you know, spread out and love the neighborhood in practical ways. We just started this thing uh, called Team Up. And the whole goal was never be about what we're doing in a country, but how do we come alongside and assist what some of the great heroes in my life that I've met people who just roll up their sleeves and give the shirt off their backs and do whatever they can to love their neighborhood with its needs. And we all know that needs go way beyond just the physical realm. Uh, and so we've been really excited to connect with four or five countries internationally. And we started some projects domestically, obviously COVID has had an influence on that of how do we say to these like-minded partners, we want to help you. And sports is such a valuable tool. It can be a component or it can be catalytic to coming alongside what you're doing, not to change what you're doing, but to add to what you're doing and saying, hey, sport can build a bridge. It's the common language of the world. We know this. We've probably all tasted it and experienced it. But maybe some people need some help and some coaching or need some resources or need an injection of energy or need to be in regular dialogue with what team ups doing so we started our own, our own organization a couple of years ago felt like it was time after being part of a larger sports ministry to branch out and and do things that were really on my heart and say we're going to invest in some of these places for the long haul and we might be there 10 15 20 years but it's about developing the local leaders and about developing the local organizations to be impactful so if we weren't there the work would continue and they would sense hey this has been really strategic and instrumental in reaching the communities. So with the building bridges, cultivating relationships with others, as you're talking about with using sport, what are a few of the principles, just, just examples that you have taken directly from the game of soccer and that you've used them in your ministry as far as just like, you talked about the assist, for instance. You're, yeah. 
goal scorer per se. You're more the assist and that that may or may not get credit. It's, it's on the score sheet, but it may or may not be seen. So what are some of the other, maybe, maybe you could talk about that one a little bit more or other. Yeah, for sure. I mean, practical examples, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of what, what a typical team up project or team up philosophy would be, but we, I used to go down with teams that would play a game and we'd talk a little bit about what's important to us in the spiritual realm and our faith. And those things were, were awesome, but I'm not 100% convinced without a long-term investment in the priorities of the local organization that we were making as big of an impact as we wanted to. So it, it clicked in with me. I mean, we've partnered now in Paraguay for many years with a really cool organization. They're feeding kids. They're trying to educate kids. They're helping local leaders, local nonprofit organizations, local churches love their neighborhood. And I said to their key leader once, I said, do you, do you want us to keep coming? Like we can bring teams, we can bring coaches, we can teach local people to coach in their neighborhood. His only comment to me was, Graham, we love when you come. But let me tell you what we're actually about. And we're doing these things predominantly to help the local people in their neighborhoods build that bridge, as you talked about. So now we, we have totally shifted gears. And that's probably some of the philosophical change that I made, which was, how do we start with a blank piece of paper with these organizations and ask them what they're trying to do? And if sport can be an assist to what they're trying to do, which in Paraguay became kind of our flagship partnership early on, then it makes sense for us to keep going there. And it's been a wonderful story of watching local leaders grow up this organization. So if we never partnered in Paraguay now, De Por Vida and our partner there would be fully established, structured, and vibrant in what they're trying to do of reaching kids, underprivileged kids, providing opportunities for kids to belong and to grow and to have a nutritious meal and be connected to a local church. Practically though, so I can get to your original question, we would take a group of athletes, doesn't even have to be a group of, of athletes that come predominantly from a Christian background who want to make a difference using their sports and using maybe their manual labor, using their heart to serve. And we would go and we would really be on the agenda of the local group hosting us. So we've done everything from, we've helped build classrooms for a local school that's trying to love its neighborhood. And in the afternoon, we put on soccer clinics and helped a local school slash church form their own soccer club because some of these kids can't afford to get into the city and be in one of the soccer academies where people are making money and so forth. So that would be one practical example. Another one is, in Peru with our partnership, which we love, it's in a very, very tough environment on the outskirts of Lima. And this organization is saying, how do we love the community holistically? And how do we help them alleviate poverty and what poverty looks like for them? So our athletes have gone down, we've played five aside tournaments in the evening to build bridges for that organization in the neighborhood. But during the day, we've actually helped provide funding and build these gardens for moms, single moms mainly, who have kids coming to the academy that we helped them start. But these moms have learned how to, in a desert, grow vegetables. And after going through an agricultural program, they have now graduated to have a garden built in their backyard. I mean, these yards are smaller than my office, but we provide a garden. Uh, and so it's service. It's connecting with people. It's providing an avenue to grow the relationships for our local partners. And if that can be done with a sports flavor, then Team Up wants to be there to assist. One of the things that, that reminds me of is just in the work that, that my ministry does all around the world. I, I liken it to if a player comes into your program and says, hey, you know, that's great that you run a 4-3-3, but I, I like playing in a 4-4-2. So I'm, I'm going to play like I'm playing in a 4-4-2. I don't care what you play because I do it the way that I do it, right? If you go in to other countries with that mindset, it's not going to work. It's, it's going to cause a lot of destruction as it would in a, in a team. And that's kind of what I hear you talking about there, particularly when we're going into cross-cultural relationships, cross-cultural ministry, it is so critical to learn. It is so critical to come in with that humble posture. And same thing when you're coming into a new team to come in and learn and we'll come in with a humble posture or else you're going to, you're either going to cause all kinds of problems or you're going to be out of that team pretty quick. 
but it's it's not going to end well if you come in with your agenda with the way you do it and think that's for sure the way it's going to be is that what i was hearing there yeah 100 percent. i mean the the mindset behind team up came out of probably lots of experiences both in in being the son of a pastor who not your typical pastor but was helping a lot of church leaders rethink what does strategy and ministry look like? What is what is the role even of the local church? So what we've tried to do, and maybe without being critical of other groups that do it differently, we've tried to say, wait a second, we actually have lots to learn from our local partners. And yeah, we have some gifts and resources and some capacity. And so whether that's some high level coaches that we take with us on some of our partner trips, whether that's a team, we just took McGill University, actually, one of our our Canadian rivals. It was really fun for me to watch this team that were from a different part of the country go and serve and maybe be from a slightly different slant from a faith perspective, but I love their posture. And I think really what we're talking about, Phil, here is, is the posture of how do we in humility come alongside and not say this is what we have to offer, but together, and our tagline is together we assist. But together, wow, what, what could be done to impact this neighborhood using sport, using education, using feeding programs, adult education? And how would all of that integratedly make a difference long term? Because really, in the end, we won't partner with somebody if it's a short term solution. We want to be in, in partnerships with people who are there for the long haul and, and whether we come or not are doing what they're doing. So it's been really interesting. And yeah, I think posture is the word that you've you've articulated there to describe our mindset, which is we want to assist. We want to learn. We, we value what our partner has to offer us because so often in my first 20 years of sports ministry is this is what we have and this is what we're bringing and this is what we do. And if you like it, we're coming Uh, slightly different posture. Absolutely. And I, and I think as, as I talked about earlier, just that's something that is so important to, to know and to really just embed in who you are is to have that humble posture when you're coming into whether it's a new team, whether it's a new job, whether it's going cross-cultural relationships, whether it's going to meet new friends, that learning posture. And, and as they say, leaders are learners. And that's just so true. And I have never seen it more true in these going into these countries. Than, totally. you know, it's funny because when we don't know a language, we don't try to just fake it. We get an interpreter. But with culture, we tend to just try to fake it and kind of come in and go, oh, we get it because it's going to be the same. Yeah, totally. It's actually funny to me. And so that's a good actually segue into the next thing I want to talk about really is you have used with your team the, the Berkman. And it, it's similar to the disc that I, that I use with, with the team that I coach as well as with some organizations. But really, it's, it's, a, it's a personality assessment. It's, it's a model of human behavior. And you use it to understand yourself, your players, and your coaches better. But I, I want to know just really why do you think it's so important to do that and and what are some res- tangible results you've experienced and seen since you've implemented that tool at Dream? Yeah, well, really good question. And you know, if I was being totally honest, it's a fairly recent thing in our program. Berkman's not recent, and I would recommend Berkman to anybody, whether you're leading a corporate team or a staff team at a church or staff team even on a soccer staff at a university. A good dear friend of mine who is a Berkman trained consultant, knows how to interpret the data, knows how to explain. He approached me and said, would you ever consider doing this with your team? Because, and then he showed me the value of how it could guide me in specific coaching of individuals or specific coaching of trends and tendencies of the team. So I'll give you a couple of examples. First of all, I think it's highly important. And as a coach that's been in the university scene for 20 years and has had teams go and play national teams. And then obviously we've been successful and we want to continue that success. I think coaching is as much X and O's and it's important, but more so now about player player and personal management and relationship building with within the team. It's so funny growing up in England, it used to all be tactics. It used to all be style of play and it, it is. And those things are becoming even more sophisticated. But if you go talk to a lot of the Premier League managers, it's about how well they play or manage and how they deal with personalities and different people's 
characteristics and, and different styles of people. So how it's worked for us at Trinity Western is obviously I've had my friend Mike come and he's done three or four different sessions with the team after they filled out their Berkman profile. And what Berkman does is it gives you an overview of people's usual behavior patterns in particular areas. But then it also then shows this is how they behave in a stressed environment. And here are some of the things that you need to look for that would help you, whether it's in motivating a player or challenging a player, learning on communication ways, and even how to identify this is where they're at. These are normal behavior patterns that they typically would demonstrate in moments of stress or in patterns of stress. So it's been really helpful. I'll give you, I'll give you two quick examples, one on a personal. So the last few years, players no longer in our program, but really butted heads a little bit personality with me. I'm a strong-willed coach, and this was a very strong-willed player. And whether she was particularly a little bit selfish or a little bit negative, that's not the point. The point is she had some of these tendencies. Well, actually, what I was beginning to learn through my time with Mike, my friend, who you know showed me her Berkman profile, those were all manifestations of some stress in her life. And how did I, as a coach, work not to coddle her, not to allow certain behaviors or attitudes to you know, be okay, but maybe to combat those with a different tactic. And for her, this player, it was not keep selling her the big picture and why her attitude had to be better this year. It was actually giving her small tasks almost in two week increments and checking in with that player to say, okay, here's where I've seen you make some progress. Here's a couple things that you got to work on, which allowed her to focus in. Cause I think when she saw the big picture, not that that was the stressful moment. There's other areas of stress in her life, whether that's from soccer or from life, being a student athlete is stressful, but it just enabled me to start to have different types of conversations with her and me to understand her more. And I think she appreciated a little bit more of the accountability and the check-ins. And then the other illustration, which I think is, is even more helpful for me, both in recruiting, but then also in coaching a team. So Mike did the Berkman profile for our team in the last couple of years. And what we discovered is we don't have a lot of self driven people. And so on the continuum of here's two or three girls in my roster that I wouldn't even need to set a fitness goal for them. I wouldn't need to set a running program for them. I wouldn't need to, because they are so self-motivated that they're off the charts and they're actually coming to me saying, coach, what else can I do? Coach, can we train more? But then I got this another group of players and it was a pretty strong group that were pretty passive, delightful young ladies and very gifted and, and talented, but needed a different approach. And I couldn't figure, well, why aren't you self-motivated? Well, that's not the question to be asking, actually. Don't get frustrated with it. Find now new mechanisms to set challenges for them. He used this illustration. He said, and he said it of himself, there are those people that if you said, I want you to win the race between here and somewhere 30 miles away. Some people won't even start the race because they're like, that's too far. I can't be bothered. Mm -hmm. But if you actually said, I want you to win this race 50 yards from here, they'd win it because it's a short-term game. Yep. And then go to them again and say, okay, I want you to reach or win the next race. And just make them run 600 races and you've achieved the same thing. And it was a really helpful illustration for me. Now, here's the best part for me because, yeah, I was pulling what's left of my hair. I was pulling it out in the last few years of how do I get this whole group corporately to be more motivated, to be more internally driven to get better. The Berkman consultant, Mike, actually said this in front of the whole group. He said, girls, if this is true of our team, then you either have to find ways as a team to pull some of you into that growing in your motivation or – this is actually telling your coaching staff, you better recruit to counterbalance this and make it a little bit more because sometimes external factors will pull some other players into that. So it was really helpful dynamic for us in thinking about who are we adding and where do they fit in the Berkman? Because do we need another one of these players who's like 70% or do we need a few others that are more in that driven role? So 
those personality assessments and particularly the Berkman have proved very, very helpful for me. Yeah, that's so great. Actually, when we train, we use an example of an oil company and it's a similar deal where there's one group in this oil company that has mostly outgoing people in their organization or in that, in that group. And then the other group has mostly reserved people in that, in that group. And so what they found was the outgoing group got a ton done, but there were a ton of mistakes. And then the reserve group didn't get much done and there were no mistakes. No mistakes. And they actually mixed the groups together and then they had better productivity and fewer mistakes. Yeah, 100%. It's a similar concept, similar idea, but that's the beauty of it. It does apply to everything because it is human behavior. And I love that example, the short-term game. That's, that's more how I'm wired. It's that short-term game, yeah. that short-term, give me that quick project. Don't give me this 10-year project that I have to sit in a cubicle and work all day on and not talk to people because I'd go nuts. And, and so I think that that is absolutely the power of these assessments, the power of these models is that we can see how each of these players are wired. And like you said, it may be, it's, it's very unlikely you're really going to change the core of who people are, but they can work on these sure. things that they're weak in, but it also may be a recruiting thing. And for bosses out there, for organizations out there to, to if you try to change your people long-term into people who they are not, they're not going to be the best, most productive employees right. and they'll probably burn out. And the same goes for players too. If yeah. you drive long-term to make them into people they're not, it's not going to work. Yeah, and or or how you would know how to manage somebody with that particular style and behavior so that they could become all that they're meant to be. They just get there differently than what is typical of the ideal player in my mind who I don't have to go tell to run during the summer. I don't, they're motivated. So yeah, it's really helpful conversation. Well, the ideal player for you is you, right? Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> no, I mean, not you, but you know what I mean? Like, okay. I think that's how we are, we are wired is we know, again, it goes back to the languages and the cultures. We're fluent in our own personality. Yeah, that's true. And so we understand the people that are like us. And we typically click with the people who are like us and we love coaching the people who are like us. Totally. And, and they also sometimes frustrate us too. As I say, if you're similar personality, the fireworks are either good or bad. It's either really good or really bad. But I do believe that that also goes to understanding yourself, which is For a sure. critical part of it. And is that, is that something also that he has talked about that you've seen? Is that understanding yourself 100%. helps you to be able to connect with and coach these, these guys? Yeah, that, that would be the other probably great takeaway. And it's something I've got to keep growing in and learning. So, I mean, it's not like you, oh, okay, I got the Berkman. So now I got it sorted out. Like you got to keep going back to this and saying, why is this, why am I feeling this way? Well, even just how I approach the player coach relationships, how I approach a bigger perspective than just how I emotionally am feeling if I'm tired or if I'm stressed or if I've come from a staff meeting where the department had some frustrating experiences and and I bring some of that into the training environment that's not going to be healthy for any of us so it, it's I say it actually starts with me of learning here's how I operate in my stress behaviors and how do I make sure that I'm operating in my normal behaviors because then players feel a little bit more safe and consistent of, of what they're going to get and there's times especially I mean we've had some deep playoff runs over the last number of years you get to the end of a playoff run and yeah, you're tired, you're fatigued. You've had to think about the next game and the next challenge and, and you probably don't treat people always the way you hope that you'll treat people. So those, those are helpful things. Self-leading probably a massive part of that. Absolutely. And Vince Lombardi, the other football again, he said, only by knowing yourself can you become an effective leader. Totally, totally agree with that. So I, I think that this goes to the last two questions, the last two conversations we just had there, I think go to something that's really important, which is it is super important to understand the other, understand the, the team that you're a part of, understand the culture that you're going into, but it's also to understand how you're wired, how you're created, that you are created to do certain things really, really well. And there's also things that you do need to work on to be able to build that side up as you talked about to be able to become that complete person that complete player but the other thing that I think that these all these principles and really this this podcast gets into is the mentality that you really 
create and foster and cultivate at Trinity Western. It's something that I've seen since the first conversation I had with you when you were recruiting my daughter. And I've seen it in the program and talking to the players and just watching you do what you do. But it's this idea of the more than soccer mentality. Can you explain the mentality, what it looks like in your program and, and really why it's the core of all you do? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a phrase that we kind of adopted a few years into me taking over the program. And some of that comes out of maybe my sports ministry background to realize that there's there's a greater picture to be seen than just whether you win a trophy at the end of the season or raise a banner. Don't get me wrong, those things are pretty fun too. But I've always felt like sport, soccer in our case, is a tool. It's an opportunity to invest in developing people. So when I took over at Trinity, coming from the the program I did at Wheaton, which probably set some pretty good foundation for me to see a bigger picture and how sport can be used to impact people's lives. I just had a desire. I I said, I have two goals. I want to become an elite program within North America and and certainly within our context here in Canada. And, And we've done that in the competitive environment. But I want to be known for a school that does it differently. And that really invests in people. And that doesn't mean some of our competitors don't invest in people, but where if you come and play at Trinity Western, you're probably saying at the end of your five years, it's the value added that really impacted my life, whether that's some of the service projects and missions trips, whether that's domestically, internationally, whether that's the leadership development that our staff have been very intentional on and exposing leadership opportunities to literally every player on our team, because every player on our team has the capacity to be a leader, whether that's some of the spiritual development. I mean, I could sit here and I would warmly tell you stories and not also just dramatic conversion stories, but like of people who would say, coach, don't even bring the faith factor in to five years later going, I can see that there's something to having a faith or a spiritual dimension to life. So to watch some incremental growth in players, leadership wise, academically, one of the things that brings tears to my eyes, one of my best players ever almost dropped out after her first year. And we had to go like crazy to get her into a couple summer school classes. And I just said to her, I mean, I won't mention her name, but you know, my goal one day is to actually see you walk across the graduation stage. And to have that happen five years later, yeah, it tells me that our program and and from a coaching perspective, I often say this, Phil, I'm afforded and I'm probably one of the luckiest guys in the world because I get a front row seat to watch, from my perspective, God put his fingerprints on my athletes over that five years. We have five years of eligibility in Canada, which is really awesome. But also to watch these people make life decisions and to see some of the changes in their attitudes and in their mindset, whether that's to go from a player who has untapped potential, but just not really experiencing it because they haven't learned to get to the next level athletically. What does athletic maturity look like? We had a kid from England a few years ago who very special player and I could see her potential. I could see her talent and she understood the game. It's not just because she's from Liverpool. It probably had something to do with it. And she, she bleeds red. But I kept saying to this young lady, like, if you could take what you have in soccer knowledge in your brain and soccer intuition and you see the game the way it should be played, but you got to have another level of athleticism. And to watch that kid get there, it wasn't just about soccer success. The kid went on to become player of the year in Canada, which is pretty special. But it was to see her be disciplined in acquiring what it took being disciplined to get that next level of athletic maturity literally through hard work and blood and sweat and toil so leadership development athletic development academic we have this philosophy at trinity western it's called the complete champion approach and lots of universities have development in other areas i really love trinity because it affords me not just the privilege but the expectation of coaches this is about developing your people for the long term And so that's what we've been about more than soccer. And we do lots of creative things to really say to those players, you're going to have the best five years of your life here, not because you might win a few championships. Hopefully we do that. But some of your life lessons you'll learn, some of the experience you've been exposed to, some of the things you'll grow into, that's what makes us successful. That's what we count as success. And that's something that I just love. It just really for life. It's something that 
a lot of people go, well, I'm going, I remember when I was in law school, there were people that said, this is just three years of my life. I'm going to bear down. I'm just going to be in my book, my head in the book the whole time. And I'm just going to study, 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 because this is my three years of my life. I said, well, if that's your attitude now. That's going to be your attitude forever. Right. And then it's, what's the next thing that you're going to just put everything into it. So I played in her murals and I, coached soccer and I worked at a church and I golfed a lot and I had fun with friends and I and so because it was three years of my life it wasn't just law school for three and so I think that that idea that concept and that you but the thing is that if you don't foster that as the coach it won't be the culture right it will be something that may or may not happen and that it can be a motto it can be a it can be something that's said but you as the leader of that program need to instill that into that, into that team. Yeah. I mean, that's a really helpful point. And obviously I believe that every team takes on large portions of their coaches, not necessarily even personality, but what makes their coach tick. And having grown up overseas, having been in so many different countries, having seen the power of sport to impact lives and open doors for access to things that I have found amazing. I, I want to share these experiences with the players that I get to coach. We share a common bond of the love of the game. Now can we use some of my experiences, some of my upbringing, my networks to expose them to a life that they probably never realized they were going to get when they signed up to play for me. The other thing that I've seen with you and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's similar to how I'm wired too. that if I see someone not performing to the level that I know they can perform, it's not going to sit well with me and I'm going to push them on that. Is that how, how you're wired there too, as the coach of that program? Yeah. I mean, I think every coach is liked by a lot of players also probably sometimes not liked by a lot of players. And some of that comes out of, I just don't ever want to lower the standards. And I think sometimes and I'd be interested in getting into this in a little bit later. I know you got one of the questions of what type of reading or things that I've seen or listened to have, have impacted me. But I think sometimes when we just let our foot off the gas and lower our standards a little bit, it's a slippery slope and that creates problems for your team corporately and individually. I think if people were honest, whether they appreciated my coach or not, they will probably say the one thing Graham did do beyond the more than soccer and the value add he didn't want to settle for mediocrity. He did not want to allow us to, every drill matters. Every, I often say every touch matters and boy, do I love it. And I have had some of these, I have a couple of them right now in my program. I've had one that just graduated, man, these young ladies, they have figured out what it takes to train the way that they would want to play. And it's going to drive them. If they do that in soccer, they're going to do that in life. Yeah. So yes, keeping your standards really high is very important to me. Yeah. You know, we joked early on in this, in this show that if you set your standards low enough, you'll hit them every time. That's definitely not a leadership principle. It's the exact opposite. I, I forget which coach said it, but it's, if perfection's your goal, you just might hit excellence. Right. And, uh, and that's really what I, I do see with you in the program. So the next thing we're going to jump into is a book that you introduced me to when I was up there visiting, and it's, it's a book called Legacy. It's mm -hmm. about the, the New Zealand All Blacks, one of the, well, if it's perennially the best rugby team in the, the most respected anyway around the world. They may not win every year, but they're the most respected. And if you haven't seen it already, folks, go check out the Amazon Prime, just a bonus. That's, that's just bonus for you. The Amazon Prime, uh, all or nothing special on the All Blacks was phenomenal. But the, this book, Legacy, really is a leadership book. It's, it's about the All Blacks, but it's really about life and leading in life. And there's a couple of the, of the principles in that book that I just want to talk to you about because sure. I know you used it with your team and it's something that you said, hey, read this book. And I did. And I'm glad you gave it to me because I used it with my high school team as well. And we went through it with the leadership team there. And the first principle is actually what the book starts with. The first chapter is about character. And the subtitle of the chapter is sweep the sheds. Never be too big to do the small things that need to be done. The little quote they have there, which they have is the, the Kumara or the sweet potato does not need to say how sweet he is. And so can you just talk about really take it from the theory to practice how, what this principle means to you and how you actually implement the principle in your teams. Yeah, I mean, the book is awesome. And probably because it's a few years older now, a lot of 
good coaches would be able to probably quote sections of the book. So it's, it's, we're not talking about anything new. A lot of coaches will know about legacy, but what I really enjoyed about the book, and, and I don't mean this arrogantly at all. I just remember reading the first time I read, it, I was going through the first few chapters preparing for a leadership meeting with some of my core leaders on my team. And I was really excited because I went, wait a second, we do this. Wait a second. We've done that for 15 years. And, and again, that's not to, to prop us up, but it was a reinforcement to me of, Graham, you're on the right road with a lot of the things that you've espoused to or you've really endorsed over the last 10, 15 years as you've grown as a coach. The sweeping the sheds mentality, I mean, there's other ways of saying it. Simon Sinek wrote a book called uh, Leaders Eat Last. has a similar mentality of nobody's too big to do the smallest grunt work. And when I first took over at Trinity, and again, there's probably other coaches, I think some of this has to do with my faith perspective and following the person and, and the, the relationship with Jesus, watching Jesus model humility and servant leadership. Uh, and servant leadership doesn't mean weakness. It actually means strength. So to hear that the leaders, the captains of the All Blacks, the, the best stars of the All Blacks, each pulls their weight and d- takes their turn on sweeping the change room at the end of, we all can identify. We've all been in messy change rooms. We have all had grunt work to do. I was growing up in England. It used to be that the apprentice players would polish the boots of the first team players in some of the clubs that I was connected to. And everybody has to do it. But this mindset that says, no, 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 in our culture, it's not seniors that have the elevated status. They're respected, but also there's a lot to expect of them. So what we've done since I took over the program, lots of coaches will identify with this. Sometimes rookies come in and they're a little fearful of where do I fall in the pecking order? And without making them feel like royalty, we have always taken an upside down approach, which says actually rookies are going to be the most cherished people because they're the latest edition of the Spartans. And so when we show up for our first day of preseason, everybody lives on campus for the first three weeks. It's my seniors that are welcoming them in the parking lot and with their moms and dads, my seniors and my juniors are, are taking their luggage up to the dorms and they're making that young rookie who's probably peeing her pants trying to figure out what did I just get into and we make them feel like a million bucks and I've always I always remember some of my rookies a few years ago saying coach we can't believe that rookies eat first and every meal rookies eat first and the reality is and eventually as the season goes on each year that dissipates not because we don't value it anymore but because everybody's learned to realize doesn't matter whether you're a rookie or a senior, you're a leader and you've got some expectations to serve and to care for others. And you have an expectation to grow our culture. So whether it's this leaders eat last mentality, sweeping the sheds, I was really funny last year and I won't go into all the reasons. I was pretty annoyed because I am a detailed person and around our changing room complex, obviously the two teams, men's and women's teams have probably been banging their cleats and some mud slinging and so forth. And it didn't get swept the day of a game. And I was irate that this hadn't happened. And then I just stopped and went, wait a second, I'm here an hour early. I can sweep this. And because if I'm going to endorse this mindset, I got to live it out as well. So there's nobody too big, no role. The other practical ones is this is cultural for us is when we move our portable goals around, whether it's to play 6v6 or 8v8 or full field or whatever, if I ask for goals to be moved, it's not just one or two people that are quick to jump and say, hey, let's go, it's everybody. Uh, Because that's an expectation of nobody's too big in this program to do the small things. Yeah, there were so many good little quotes in that that chapter too. And I remember they had quotes from 
John Wooden and Bill Walsh and, and some of these other great coaches about the day. And they were all basically about the idea that it's character that's going to win the, win the games. It's, it's, it's much more important about talent. But the one quote that really stuck out to me, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. I know it's, it's a bit of an overstatement. Obviously, the All Blacks, this, as you'll hear the quote, you'll know it's an overstatement. But I think the point is very clear. And one of the All Blacks players, legends, said, talent was irrelevant. We picked high work rate, strong body movers, guys that were unselfish, and had a sacrificial mindset. And, you know, how, when you're, when you're looking at players, when you see your team, when you watch the young women coming into your program, and obviously talent was irrelevant is, is an overstatement because they had to be a certain bar. But I think once you get to that certain bar, above that, it's, you're going to pick those players. So how do you do that? And it, this is kind of going into the recruiting, but obviously some of it is, is just, dumb luck. But at the end of the day, how are you screening for that when you're recruiting as you're developing culture on your team? How do you reinforce that culture so that the, the slacker, so that the people who aren't going to have that work rate are, are seen as this isn't part of our culture? Yeah, it, really good question, Phil. I mean, there's lots that we could unpack because one of them is the characteristic of whether they're a little lazy or lacking motivation, lacking hunger. That's one issue. The other one for me that I've had to wrestle with, and I don't know if I've always got it right, of talent wins over or, or character wins over talent. What do you do when one of your most talented, dangerous forwards maybe is more selfish? Uh, and how do, you, how do you have the fine line between actually embracing that selfishness because that's what helped make that young lady be legitimately awesome but also not have it affect the team. And I haven't always made the right decisions on that. So it, it's an ongoing process. I think every situation is a bit unique, but, but generally I would say, and I'd say this more and more in recruiting, people often ask me now, I've been on particularly in the age of COVID, so many Zoom recruiting calls, whether that's to teams or to individuals, they ask, what's, what's the characteristics of the players you're looking for? Number one, before they can finish their sentence is hunger. And not to necessarily always quote books or prop up things that I've read, because I'm sure others have read some, some better stuff, but Patrick Lencioni writes a book called The Ideal Teammate. Mm -hmm. And I had to read that for my master's program in leadership and very simple book, actually very easy to read, could read it in the afternoon. But he talks about humility, basically emotional intelligence called smarts. And then the third characteristic is hunger. Mm -hmm. And you know what, some of the questions that some of the worksheets that come along with that book that articulate how you define hunger and how you can identify hunger. If kids don't have hunger now, it's a long shot that we're going to recruit them. You could be less talented and have a desire to work and we're going to bring you into our program because you will always desire to get better. And you're right. There's a threshold. You have to have a level of competency, a level of talent, but I want players who are not going to shy away from hard work. They're going to embrace it. I want players who aren't going to be satisfied with just making the standard. They want to recreate the standards. And that's probably what's helped us over the years have success in terms of championships and being in the elite programs in Canada or playing some good Div 1 schools down in the States and doing well. The, the one that I've wrestled with, and this is really where I maybe go back and read that chapter, is what do you do when you have four or five of your players who have helped you talent wise get to that elite level, but maybe aren't helping you always consistently win because it's about them versus being about the team. And those are wrestle and struggles that I've had to, had to see. So legacy was really helpful in setting me free sometimes of making some hard decisions. I, I wish sometimes I had made some other hard decisions because it's come back and, now I could give you an example of where I didn't make the right decision that had I maybe gone with a player of more substance, less selfishness, maybe we win a playoff game that we should have. So, Well, I mean, it's hard to kick yourself too much, though, because recruiting is a funny thing in that you can talk to coaches, you can watch video, you can go watch a game, but it's really hard to tell the, the character of that player, especially when they're away from home. Totally. You know, there's so many variables that go into it. But, but I do think that – You've alluded to it in this la in the last answer. The the other chapter I want to talk about really 
is the chapter. It's, it's got a different title in the book. You can go pick up the book, but for the sake of this family show, we're not going to use the actual title of this chapter, but it's really the no viruses chapter. It's the follow the spearhead. And you've alluded to that where these players can come in and they may or may not be intentionally doing it, but they are a, are a virus. And really the, the analogy that follow the spearhead is referring to birds flying the V-shaped formation is 70% more efficient when you're in that. But if one of those birds jumps out of the of the formation, or if you're using a bicycling analogy, if you're drafting and one of the bikes pulls out of that, then it affects everybody and it it actually drags on the whole rest of the group. So what does that look like? And knowing that soccer is a weak link sport, knowing that you are only as strong as your weakest link, as John Wooden said, a player who makes the team great is better than a great player. But the corollary, the opposite of that is the player who drags the team down is, is worse than a, a bad player. Yeah. So what, how do you address that? When you have that in your team, what are some ways you've addressed it well? And what are some ways that maybe, you, you know what, I wonder what would have happened if I would have done X, Y, or Z? Yeah. I mean, I'm living that over the last few years, if I had to be honest with you, Phil. In reality, I mean, there's no right answer other than the principles that say, be willing to make hard decisions for the sake of the team. And sometimes I've made the wrong decision, what I thought was for the sake of the team, because I was hoping, or and I want to unpack a little bit of grace as well, wanting to be gracious to a kid that you hope will grow and hope will learn and hope will change behaviors or attitudes. And so I think there is sometimes a willingness within reason to work with a player who maybe has an edge or has too much of a selfish mentality, too much of a negative attitude, because you want to see them reach their, for lack of a better term, redemptive potential. And you want to see them thrive in the team and they're not a bad kid. They just unfortunately have learn some bad behaviors. I will work with that player for a period of time. I have some more more recent examples where I, I made the wrong decision and I kept a player in that core group who ridiculously talented, but when push came to shove and it became about the team, that's where she probably stepped out of that spearhead mentality and it hurt us and it bit us in the butt. The other side of things is there is a player in my past coaching years who I probably kept around for a couple of years longer than I, I think probably she would appreciate that she stayed. And, and I appreciate that she stayed because I really wanted to see this kid finish well. But at the same time, we had to make a hard decision. And we both said for the betterment of, of her sanity and for the betterment of our team culture, it's just not a good fit. And was I being ungracious when I made that decision? I, I actually don't think so because the bigger picture is, Who knows what now lessons she will have learned from that and what lessons I will have learned from that. So it's a, it's a delicate balance. Um, I'm not telling coaches, anybody who's selfish on your team, go get rid of Mm -hmm. because sometimes selfishness channeled in the right way can produce brilliant performances, but it can, can never be at the cost of your team. And like you said, I mean, particularly at the nine, particularly up top at the striker position, that's often what makes a great striker is that bit of arrogance, that bit of it's about me. And, but to channel that to a team where it's not about you, but you can still get your stats. (laughs) We talked earlier about some of the cultural things we've done. Coaches are good at this. You'll know if you have those characteristics in your team and, and what level you want to keep them. You certainly don't want the balance of your team to have that mentality. Oh, that's good luck. It's going to implode when it matters most. But we've done things. I mean, we had one of the most ridiculous individual talents in our program in the last five years, player of the year in Canada, set records. And I applauded some of her selfishness because she that drove her to be that good but we also worked really hard as a team to keep growing in terms of our team chemistry and team building exercises off the field. And even nights before playoff games or championship games to continue to bring it back to what are we aspiring to achieve and what are we about? And so I've had good examples of harnessing that in the right direction. Unfortunately, I've got some, some examples where I, in hindsight, wish I'd made better decisions to protect the team culture. Yeah, and that's something that goes for soccer teams, that goes for organizations, that goes for not 
families, really, because you can't kick your kids out. I guess you could, but that's not that's not what it is. But th- I think that goes to your wanting to build into the players too. And if your kids going sideways, you don't just say, "Well, go and go somewhere else." It's like, no, that this is I'm a steward over your life, and you are a steward over the lives of these these women coming into your program. But with that, how much of it is building that culture into the team so that they really self enforce this culture too? And they if they see that that they will go, hey, this isn't who we are as Trinity Western. What does that look like as you're establishing the core leadership of your team? And how important is that in what you do? Oh, it's massive. And I think it ebbs and flows. So there'll be moments, if I, if I wrote a book on the last 10 years of my program, we've had really sweet spots where the team is able to kind of police the attitudes and the behavior and the, and police is not meant to be a, a negative word, but they don't need a head coach, bad cop to come in and lower the boom. I've had to do that sometimes because maybe the leadership group is, is younger and, and trying to establish itself because they carry the right set of characteristics that you want your team to embody. So I think every coach has to assess where's my culture at, what is, what's the leadership strength can the leaders handle this? How do I help coach the leaders? To And I've had to do that. We transitioned from a, a servant leader as a captain to now two co-captains. And they each lead differently, those three, three phenomenal players. But I've had to almost say to my current co-captains, I want to keep entrusting you to handle this one. I want to keep developing you. And if you need my help, I'm here. But at the same time, I don't want you to be captain by name, but not have the ability to build in. And before you know it, good leadership is infectious and it's contagious. And I think now I have a sweet spot again, where I have seven or eight girls that are willing to step up and say, Hey, you know what? That attitude doesn't fit here. It's okay. You can be upset. You didn't play. It's okay. You can be upset. Things haven't gone your way. But how are you channeling that to be better for all of us? Uh, unfortunately, in previous years, maybe we had a lot of strong-willed people who weren't always the most supportive or willing to stand up and say, no, 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 we don't do that here. So every, every coach has to assess where they're at in their program, whether they take on that role or whether they can allow their leadership. And it sounds like from reading Legacy, they just had an ongoing culture of whether you're a captain or somebody who's a leader and responsible for the protection of the culture, willingness to stand up. I think that's particularly harder in coaching females where there's such a desire to be accepted and liked. And and we have to keep fostering. I have five or six players who are not the captains who have leadership written all over them. They just need to be challenged, kicked, pushed, pulled, encouraged because it's in them. And now once they start to risk and have it come out of them, holy cow, it's going to help our team culture just go through the roof. And we're already a good team team culture, but now watching new leaders be willing to say, no, 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 this is what we want to uphold. Very important. Absolutely. And that's really the identity there too. I mean, that's part of the challenge you have too. It's in college as well. I mean, talk about identity formation they're figuring out who they are. That's when, you know, the insecurities are flying high. One of the last interviews I, I did was about insecurities and it's not just a young child thing or a teen thing or a young adult thing. It's a human thing and it's the insecurities that we have and how they manifest. And I think that just kind of hits a fever pitch in, in high school.